Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. My name is Jill Foos. I'm a functional medicine and integrative nutrition health coach. I created this podcast to bring you along as we travel down intriguing science-packed roads, debunking old medical paradigms and perusing new innovative therapies and modalities with the finest functional medicine doctors, practitioners, and like-minded biohackers while living our best life. Enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode on the Health Trip Podcast. Every August, I celebrate my hair loss to hair growth journey, especially because it's Hair Loss Awareness Month. It's been 25 years of ups and downs for myself, and I no longer worry about my hair loss. I found my unique hair growth equation over the years, and I look forward to many new curls in the future. That being said, I know that many of you out there are still struggling with hair loss, shedding, and thinning. I feel your pain, your frustration, and your deep concern. Healthy hair is beautiful, and it's a part of a woman's identity. And when it's lifeless, we feel part of that. At least I did. I strive to bring you all the very best doctors in their respective fields, and today is a big win. My guest today is going to break down hair loss and the many treatments that exist to turn it around. There's no one-size-fits-all approach to hair loss. We all have a unique solution. Dr. Lady Dai is double board certified in dermatology and dermatopathology. Dr. Dai has clinical experience in hair loss and pigmentation disorders, including ethnic skin and hair disorders, and is viewed as a leader in her field. She has conducted clinical trials for hair loss and presented at many national, international, and local community meetings. She has authored many publications and continuously researches, explores, and analyzes current and latest therapies and technological advancements, often providing the first of its kind treatment, whether to target hair loss or to rejuvenate the skin. Prior to opening Dye Dermatology Center, she held several positions simultaneously at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. She was a dermatologist and assistant professor. She also served as the director of Rush Dermatology Medical Residency Program, where dermatology res residents flourished under her guidance. As a result of Dr. Dye's academic background, she is passionate about educating her patients so that they can share in the decision-making. During patient encounters, after a diagnosis has been rendered, Dr. Dye often introduces choices describing the options and its risks and benefits that lead to a mutually agreed therapeutic decision. Dr. Dye believes in patient engagement during the treatment journey as part of a successful outcome. And here is my podcast um, medical disclaimer. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice or for making any lifestyle changes to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any of my guests on my podcast. So sit back, open your minds, and let's deep dive into hair loss and hair loss solutions with Dr. Dai. Hi, Dr. Dai. Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. I am so excited to have you here today. So am I. Thank you for having me. August is Hair Loss Awareness Month, and we have a lot to talk about since we're just about the halfway point through this celebratory month. Absolutely. So one of the interesting things about you is that you're a trained traditional dermatologist. That's how you started your medical career. And now you are an expert in hair loss. And I would just love for you to share with the listeners how that came about for you. So for me, it's kind of like a convoluted journey because when, you know, it started out when I was a resident and you know how, I would present cases to my attendings and every time I would talk about or mention that this patient is coming in for hair loss, they're kind of like, well, you know, what, what, what's, uh, what's the main reason why they're coming? And then I'm like, well, they have acne, but they also have hair loss. And they'd always respond about acne, but never really address the hair loss. And so, you know, I always felt like, you know, I was always at a loss. So after finishing and, and, and 
It's really interesting because that's the reason why when you go to a lot of, you know, dermatologists that not all of them are equally trained. Right. So when I finished my residency, you know, I, I um, went into academics right away. So I joined Rush University Medical Center and uh, part of being a uh, attending at an academic, you know, place, you have to proclaim a niche or some area that you really, you know, have a passion for. So then I, I told my chair at that time that, you know, I really want to learn more about hair loss, but I don't know much about it. So is there an opportunity for me to actually continue my education as I'm working here as a professor? So then my, you know, my, my chair said, oh my God, that's wonderful. We need people like you who really has a passion mm -hmm. for hair loss. So then, so part of my uh, tenure when I was at the university, I was able to visit, um, you know, the the the, the few, um, uh, you know, I consider hair loss experts in the country. So I'd spend a little bit of time with each one of them at different places in the country while still I'm attending at the university. So that's what, I mean, that's how I, I established a hair loss clinic when I was at the university. Well, thank goodness you became passionate about it because we need more doctors like you who are niching down into hair loss, especially women doctors, right? Because we come with our own unique set of risk factors that are different from men. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, I read when I was preparing for this podcast for, with you, I read in PubMed that approximately 80% of women by the time they are 60 years old experience hair loss. Is that still the stat? That is the statistics. Um, I mean, you know, you, the, the, there's a wide range of statistics that you read online, you know, but, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's a very large number, right? I mean, it's very it's astonishing. Alarming. Yeah, it's very alarming, actually, because, you know, I, I, you know, I really don't think hair loss in women is recognized as much as hair loss in men. So, I, <clears throat> because I mean, the, there's a lot of reasons because women are not comfortable talking about it. You know, they're embarrassed, they're ashamed. Um, luckily, we've got lots of different ways where we can camouflage hair loss, but really primarily, um, you know, the old statistics definitely gives an estimate of a little bit of a lower um, prevalence and incidence, but that is, that is a true number, approximately 80%. By yeah, the, right. Yeah. And also, I think that women are going to their doctors. And like you stated earlier, that most traditional dermatologists are not specifically trained in hair loss. So they really don't know how to handle it. And a lot of time, by the time that woman comes to me as a health coach for my services, they've been dismissed by multiple doctors. Like, oh, this is just part of aging. It's part of menopause. And, and you know, you can't really tell. Well, we can tell. And I, I, I've been on my own journey for 25 years and it's, you know, as you know, it's um, not a fun journey to be on. No, I mean, I, 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 I've been doing this for a little bit over 20 years and, um, you know, um, a lot of my, um, patients who has hair loss really goes through a lot of anxiety that they, that, that they're so affected emotionally by this condition. And partly just like you said, they've already been through so many different doctors being dismissed one or having tried so many different things. So then they go through what I call treatment fatigue. Mm. So, you know, the, the, they're just exhausted trying different things. And here's another tidbit that I think everybody should realize that by the time you realize that you have hair loss, interestingly studies show that you, you had already lost approximately 25% of mm. your hairs on your scalp by the time it has become clinically evident. So, and then, you know, then you go around, you look for physicians, then, you know, that just adds time. So time and money. A lot of these treatments yeah. that we're going to talk about are not covered by insurance. And so you really want to make sure you're in the hands of a doctor like you, who's very well educated on the ins and outs of hair loss. So what are some of the biggest drivers of hair loss? I know for me on my 25 year journey, <clears throat> I'll just mention a few and then you can fill in. 
<clears throat> for me, I had a partial thyroidectomy over 25 years ago, and that half a thyroid has been the root cause of so many of my health issues, including on again and off again hair loss. Um, birthing five babies, having five pregnancies, and those hormonal fluctuations also cause, triggered hair loss for me. And then stress, you know, stress going through a divorce. Um, genetically, I know that I'm predisposed to hair loss. And um, when my diet isn't right, that that also triggers hair loss. So I'm super susceptible to hair loss whenever something is not perfectly aligned. What are you seeing? So that's amazing because you've actually already covered practically um, almost everything. <laughs> yeah. So hormonally, you've got the pregnancy aspect, you've got the health aspect, um, and the the other aspect is menopause, but mm -hmm. you, you've covered that as well. Anytime, um, you know, I would say when you're sick, it doesn't have to be just your thyroid um, being anemic it is a huge factor in mm -hmm. uh, you know, hair shedding or hair loss, right? So as a, um, like, you know, my young adolescents, you know, w w when their periods are heavy or when they're on restrictive dieting or diets, right? J j just like you said, mm -hmm. that they do experience that transient um, hair shedding. The other things, uh, of course, the more recent, you know, and, and you've also mentioned it, stress, but the more recent stress is COVID. Right. Yep. Just fearing COVID or being sick from COVID. Oh my gosh. I'd had a slew of patients come in, uh, you know, not typically complaining of hair loss, like existing patients who comes in for just skin cancer, right. You know, um, examination, they've actually come in complaining about hair loss for the first time in their life. So, so you've, you, you've hit, you know, I, I, I think you've got it all covered. Yeah. There's also chemo, which we talked about briefly before we went on the podcast. And then also I'd like to mention autoimmunity and medications. Certain medications can trigger Those hair are loss. Good. Yeah. Definitely. Are the treatments the same across the board for all of these, or do you really have to fine tune your approach? And we're going to go through a lot of treatments, but just overall. You definitely have to fine tune your approach because there's a lot of different types of hair loss. And that is why it is really important to go to somebody who knows about hair loss so that you get the diagnosis correctly so that you can go on the treatment pathway. There are going to be some treatments where there's going to be overlapping, you know, uh, treatments, but there are some conditions where the treatment is completely different from you know, e e each pathway. So diagnosis is going to be the key. So can you give us an example? Like if someone is coming in and they have, you know, one or two autoimmune disease and they're experiencing hair loss versus someone who like myself, maybe it's just hormonal going through menopause and some stress. So, so I'm going to give you an example of, um, um, 95% of the patients will have genetic thinning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the hereditary thinning. So, so I would say ninety five percent of the uh, patients with hair loss will have genetic thinning. But in addition, and here's the problem: in addition, there's going to be other factors along the way, such as menopause, right? For example, or you know, autoimmune disease or medications that causes their hair loss. So, for somebody who has genetic thinning, who's also taking, for example, beta blockers, who who we we know can cause hair loss, but there's no way around the beta blockers. If you need it, you need it, right? You know, because that's a heart medication, but we can address the hereditary thinning by giving them, for example, you know, I, I, I'm a trained physician, so I give out medications. So for someone like like that individual, I may decide to do oral minoxidil, or I may decide to do an anti-DHT uh, therapy. But for somebody, for for example, who has, um, uh, I would say, like you know, a completely diff different disease, like alopecia areata, but the diffuse type of alopecia areata, where you know you're just mm -hmm. shedding, that's an autoimmune type of disease. So the treatment is going to be completely different because I'm going to have to make sure that I modulate your immune dysfunction okay. so so that it doesn't attack your own hair follicles. So then I will be using things along the lines of steroid, 
or some of the new drug inhibitors that we now, you know, was just recently FDA approved. Yeah. And we're going to dive deep into a lot of these different treatments, but it sounds like testing is really important. And most people are not going to get this comprehensive testing just by going to their traditional dermatologist or maybe family physician. So let's talk about testing while we're here on the topic. What are things that you're going to um, look at in terms of testing? So, I mean, you know, um, so I always, and, and, you know, when I lecture residents, you know, I always tell my residents that when we see a hair loss patient, it's really important to listen to them, right? Because part of, um, you know, what, what, what what's going to make you come to a correct diagnosis is listening to your patients, the number one. The laboratory workup, in my opinion, is just a small part of the actual evaluation because you got to examine the scalp. I mean, you wouldn't believe how often I hear patients tell me that, well, my, my doctor told me to do this and this and didn't even look at my scalp, you know? So, I mean, yeah. there's so many information that you can get from, from the scalp because, I mean, you already know this, you know, from your personal experience that like you know, your scalp has to be healthy. There's a lot of clues that I can see from just examining your scalp. Now, as right. far as blood work, the basic blood works that I do, um, you know, I do my thyroid, you know, ask for thyroid mm -hmm. testing. I test for vitamin D. I test for anemia. If I do suspect that you do have an autoimmunity like lupus or something, then I will, um, you know, um, get your, AN, you know, uh, what I call the autoimmunity uh, markers, such as the ANA, and then I'll dive deep if that comes back as abnormal. So those yeah. are sort of my starting, um, you know, um, testing. Yeah. And two additional tests that I liked on for myself and have helped my clients get if they need it are a micronutrient test, which looks at your cellular nutrient status. So are you getting all of the nutrients into your cell so that you can optimize that mitochondria? Because as we know, if your cells aren't healthy, it's going to be really difficult to grow hair, right? Because we don't need hair to survive and we need other things to be working. And yeah. the other test I look at is genetics. So, um, which you probably have done too. I know that you required, um, when I chose to come work with you, and we're going to talk about what I did with you later on, I brought in my genetics so that you could look at that. So I think how important is looking at that genetic panel? To me, it's a very important test, but one of the barriers to that testing, as you know, is the financial aspect because yep. it's not covered by, you know, by, uh, you know, your uh, medical insurance. Right. But if you do have the luxury of obtaining that testing, it is so important because it allows us to be able to see which medication or which treatment are you going to are you going to respond best so that you can optimize your treatment just like you said right so a few minutes ago you were saying it can become very expensive to go to all of these different doctors and have these failed attempts to grow hair so for me you know putting up a couple hundred dollars to get more testing so that I can get more precision on the direction I need to go and take the guessing out. What do we say? Test don't guess, um, was worth it for me because I had had so many years of failed attempts that I just said, forget it. Let's just do find out all the data on my hair, my unique hair loss situation. So we can get to the root cause and get on the right path instead of these guessing games that, that cost a lot of money. So either way you're going to be spending your money. So it's smart money well spent. I could not agree with you more personalized, you know, it's all about yep. personalized medicine. Yeah. Let's talk about early treatment being key. One of the things you said in the beginning of the podcast was a lot of women become embarrassed and they don't want to talk about it. And, you know, women are just learning how to talk about menopause with each other and learning how to go to their doctors and have more educated conversations. So hair loss is one of those things where it is part of our identity. And when we lose it, especially during a time of stress or divorce, when you're going to be this single person and out there in the world, and all of a sudden your hair is shedding, it's, a um, but how, how crucial is that early detection um, when your hair loss starts? 
I can't emphasize the importance of um, you know early intervention. The earlier that you intervene, the better outcome or you know success you'll have, especially when it comes to specific types of hair loss. So I'm talking about somebody who has, for example, a cicatricial alopecia or a scarring type of alopecia. Right, and you know, as you are, as you are aware, that is a completely different animal. That 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 that's how you know. I look at it because every time, every hair that you lose during that initial process of inflammation, you will not get back. So what that means is it's a irreversible type of hair damage that is happening on the scalp. So now when you talk about, for example, the non-scarring alopecia like telogen effluvium, you know, it's just a fancy word for hair shedding secondary to, you know, pregnancy or COVID or stress, you know, not, not, now that tends to be what I call a temporary thing, but in 90, uh, and, and you know, the, there are um, studies have shown that 90% of the time it is going to be reversible, but there is a 10% of the time where you stay stuck in that chronic telogen effluvium phase. So that, 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 you know, that that's uh, what I call another different uh, um, entity. Then you have the hereditary thinning um, that, you, you know, that uh, as you know, um, we can treat, but again, one person can have multiple different diseases all going on at the same time. <laughs> right, right. Let's talk about the hair follicle for a minute, because I think it's really important to really understand how this, this organ works on our scalp and all the things that can affect it. And also when talking about early detection and prevention, how long till, how long till that hair follicle can die for good? Not talking about the one, the examples you just gave, but just in general, if someone is losing their hair and they're waiting a long time to go see a doctor, how long do they really have? So I can tell that with our statistics that the better outcome is always associated with somebody who's had hair loss within 10 year period. Mm, so, okay. and we're talking about hair loss that are considered the non-scarring, you know, types of hair loss. So, so anyone who's had hair loss for, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. So for example, you know, I'm just going to pick on a man mm -hmm. <laughs> because um, somebody who's had 30 years of hair loss, you can kind of tell because they've lost, right, the mm -hmm. crown and they've only preserved the back. So when someone like that comes to me and is seeking help, um, I, I, you know, I, I am very honest and I would tell them that the likelihood of you, you know, regaining a full set of hair is really, you know, pretty close to zero. But if you want to try it, you know, I'll get on the journey with you. But I just want to tell you what the statistics have shown. So that's the answer. It's usually within a 10 year period. Oh, well, that's a lot longer than I think most people would think. But, you know, within the 10 year period, all that means is you can reverse some, but it doesn't mean that you're going to fully regrow whatever you right. have. Right. So ideally, the earlier the intervention, so I'm talking about if you're only been losing hair for like a year or two or three years, then we can potentially get everything back. But, you know, it's, re I mean, every individual is going to be different because there's a lot of different factors that's driving the hair loss. So we also have to take that into account. Yeah. So let's go back to the hair follicle. So the hair follicle, once it falls out, is it guaranteed that any hair coming back once you start whatever treatment you do it's still going to be miniaturized the hair is not going to be as thick as it once was no not not i mean uh, not necessary at all because there's um um there's a lot of drivers of uh you know what, what um um dictate the size of the follicles so if for example you know i we 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 lose one hair follicle, but if you attend to it right away and get help, right, within, you know, a short period of time and a short, and in, in, in that period of time, you know, a year is short for me, but a, a year can be, you know, long for somebody else because, um, 
because there are so many different factors that's driving the the the, the rapidity at which rate you're losing hair mm -hmm. so so somebody can fully recover yet exactly the same situation on another individual yet they will not recover you know the the, the robustness of the follicles yeah for me on my personal journey i've been able to absolutely recover my volume my hair volume thanks to you and and other people that i've worked with in my lifestyle which we're going to talk about but um, I also started and I was on top of it immediately exactly. when I noticed that I had profuse, uh, hair shedding and thinning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and that's the key, you know, you address right. it right away and you right. know, how to speak out. so, right. Right. And hair, hair takes a really long time to grow. So yeah. this is a process that someone must be patient. all in and patient. And there all are lots of all in like <laughs> I, I tell people all the time growing hair and and also just living a healthy lifestyle to 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 mm -hmm. support healthy hair growth is a full-time job now just like you have your full-time job and you go to work every day and the first couple of weeks are really difficult and there's a lot of stress and anxiety and you know you're you're just feeling kind of awkward that's how it is with hair growth and then all of a sudden that new lifestyle and all of that um that new way of shifting your, your mental focus on all the things you need to do to grow healthy hair becomes easier, but you have to be all in every day. I agree. That's, that's what I tell my patients. You got to be committed. Yeah, yeah totally committed. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about HRT in women. So hormone replacement therapy, and this is something also that I've, I use estrogen, progesterone and testosterone and there was a time many years ago when I started testosterone, where my testosterone shot up to over 900. And for a woman, you know, that is like, I, I have four boys who are in their twenties and they yeah. wish their testosterone was like that. It was really high and it triggered a massive shed on me. And it wasn't on purpose that that happened to me, obviously. Um, but I am very mindful about the testosterone levels and I keep them much, much lower talk about hormone replacement therapy and how it can affect women's hair growth or hair loss. So that's a very interesting topic. And, and, and uh, it's still to this day, a conundrum. Um, you, you know, we know that when a woman goes through menopause, um, that that is a very important milestone in their lifetime where hair shedding can happen. So now exactly what is causing it? Well, we all know that when you go through menopause, that the estrogen levels go down and there are estrogen receptors on the hair follicles. And that's, that's what we think, but there are plenty of women who goes through menopause who does not go through hair, you know, hair shedding, you know, right? So, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I, um, remembered going through all the literature, really teasing it out, you know, because I said, I want to tackle this. I want to learn about it. And at the end of the day, um, no one, no one really truly understands how the estrogen plays a role, exactly how it plays a role with hair growth. Now, in terms of, I was just going to make a comment about uh, testosterone replacement and, and um, so what happens with testosterone replacement, because I do see a lot of patients who, you know, is doing HRT and with testosterone, it gets converted to DHT. And if your hair follicle receptors is sensitive to DHT, then you can't, you know, then you, you are, or you will be susceptible to hair thinning, but not every woman's hair follicle is susceptible to DHT to a DHT. And that also is the reason why not every person who, you know, does testosterone replacement goes through hair shedding. Yeah. And I would like to say, so for the women listening right now who don't know what DHT is, it's dihydrotestosterone. And so 
testosterone converts to DHT through a um, five alpha reductase. It's an enzyme. And right. so when I get my hormones tested, you know, annually at this point, um, I used to have to do it much more often, but I always want to look at my DHT. So that's something that's really easy to add on to your sex hormone panel. Um, you can have your doctor just add DHT. And if it's really high and you're experiencing hair shedding, you know, that's another clue as to what is triggering the hair shedding. That's right. Yeah. All right. Let's um, pivot to treatments now. And I want to start by talking about um, pharmaceutical, uh, you know, oral and topical. And the most popular out there are Rogaine and Propecia. So tell us a little bit more about these yep. treatments. So, so I want your viewers to um, realize that to date, there are only two FDA approved <sighs> Um, medication for hair loss, right? So you have the topical minoxidil or Rogaine, right? You sold us yeah. Rogaine. And then you have the finasteride, um, which is the oral medication, which is an anti-DHT, but only approved for men. So, um, so it's interesting that we only have two FDA approved. Everything else that we use, we, we kind of use it, you know, um, all, you know, off-label. Yeah, off-label use. So it's been popular to use oral minoxidil as, you know, for for hair growth, but that is not approved for um, hair growth. So, you know. Right. But it's safe for women to use. They just need to use oral minoxidil at a lower dose than men. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so again, it's going to the right physician who knows how to prescribe it, you know, finding the right person uh, but yes because oral minoxidil traditionally has been used at, you know for, as a blood pressure lowering agent but unfortunately did did not do well as a you know um you know blood pressure lowering agent and so they took it off the market but definitely has regained popularity because we can use it in small amount of doses you know um, for hair growth now are there any side effects to using oral or topical minoxidil or finasteride. Yeah, there's definitely uh, yeah yeah definitely side effects. Um, so when it comes to topical minoxidil, some patients rarely can get a headache. This is an unusual you know it's an unusual side effect that I don't think you know um, people realize they can get a headache. But the more common side effects is increased facial hair growth uh, with the um, uh, topical minoxidil. However, the oral minoxidil can also give you both headache, increase, uh, you know, facial hair growth, but it can also cause um, initial shed before, you know, you get right. I am um, so glad that you mentioned that Dr. Dai, because when I started taking oral minoxidil, um, oh, actually it was a topical version, which I want to talk about with you, but I didn't, my doctor forgot to tell me that that could happen. And so this was years ago when I was in very new on this journey. And when I started seeing the increased hair shedding, I panicked yeah, and I yeah. stopped using it, which is the wrong thing to do. Correct. Correct. So I want everyone to know when you start it and your hair is shedding, that means it's working Correct. and that's going to last sometimes for three to four months. For me, it was the longer end on four months. And then it turns and it starts to work. And then of course we said hair takes a really long time. So this is a really long journey. And I've had women who have seen other doc functional medicine doctors who have started the minoxidil. Their doctor has not told them. They call me frantic and I have to explain to them, keep going. It's yeah. horrible in the beginning, but don't give it, give up yet. That's good. I'm so glad for people like you, please. <laughs> Please yeah. tell them, keep going, do not give up because right. I, I mean, you know, I can see when, you, you know, if you're not educated properly, right. That, 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 you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're already losing hair and then you start using this product and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I, then I'm even losing even more hair. So, so I totally agree. And then the other side effects that I, you know, not to be taken lightly is um, heart palpitation because mm -hmm oral minoxidil lowers the blood pressure and sometimes your you know body compensates by increasing the heart rate um, but that usually happens within three hours of taking the medicine and so you'll know right away 
Um, and then the latter side effects that can happen, um, uh, usually within three to four months after taking the medicine is water retention. So sometimes you can see it in your ankles, you know, getting swollen and then extremely, extremely rare, you can actually collect water in your heart. So that's something, you know, uh, um, if you start feeling short of breath, then you definitely need to see your physician. So I disclose all these to my patients. Yeah. Though though rare, but you know, I, I still think that you need to know. Now, as far as finasteride, um, decreased sexual libido is you know a, a potential side effect. Well, in men, you know, erectile dysfunction, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, as you know, um, you know, there's controversy about uh, decreasing sperm motility and potentially, affect, you know, uh, affecting their um, or regaining their function for reproductive purposes in uh, men. So then, and so then would finasteride not be good for men who are in childbearing years? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, so I, in my practice, I always counsel my, uh, you know, male patients that we have this option, but at the same time, at, in my practice, I'm able to deliver uh, anti-DHT directly into the scalp. So, you know, either by way of injection or, you know, by other modalities that I think you've tried. So, so I have those types of conversation with, with, you know, with my patients, because I am sensitive to the fact that if any of these things happen before their reproductive years, right, it, you know, it, it's something very crucial. So I just have an open conversation and I like to really engage my patients and, you know, we, we talk about it and we decide together on, on, you know, yeah. what we think is the best thing. Yeah. Um, and then the other, um, potential side effect of uh, finasteride is because it goes through the liver. So in some individuals, it can cause hepatitis or inflammation of the liver. So. Okay. And then a little bit newer and less known would be the compounded formulas. Mm -hmm. So things like 82M, 82F, and 82D, which is, um, so 82 minoxidil and then finasteride and then dutasteride. Tell us a little bit about these and what makes them so unique compared to just regular Propecia or uh, minoxidil. So I, the, they, uh, the, the 82M, 82F, 82D, so F stands for finasteride, D stands for dutasterides, uh, and, 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 it's a, and it's a combination of minoxidil with those anti-DHT. So when they've done studies in the compounded formula, they've not really shown any significant physiologic, uh, you know, um, the, there is a tiny bit of absorption in picogram concentration, but not enough to really show any physiologic, uh, um, you know, dysfunction. So that's the beauty about, um, you know, having these compounded, uh, you know, formula available because it can help you're, you're getting the minoxidil and, and at the same time, the anti-DHT effects. Right. And I think there's another ingredient there that helps it also dry on your scalp quickly. Right. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, tried to know. And because, um, people who use Rogaine or Propecia sometimes complain in terms of styling, or it could be sticky or dry or whatever it is in, or irritating. I actually use 82M and I tried stopping to use 82M a year ago. And that's what triggered hair loss for me all over again. Even though I had another stacked protocol that I continued, it was just changing one thing in my equation to see if I didn't need it anymore. And I should have known better with my experience, with my experience, but whatever, it was a, you know, learning lesson for me, but 82M has worked very well for me. Um, my, with all my curls, it's really easy to style my hair, which is really important. I'm always in front of the camera. So I think people have to really look at their lifestyle, um, in terms of making these choices too. Um, definitely agree. I mean, the, 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 um, Whatever you decide to use, you need to use something that is that has to be compatible with your lifestyle. Yeah. Use it, use convenience, because otherwise you won't use it. And if you don't use it, you're not going to be compliant. And if you're not compliant, right, it sits on the shelves. You're wasting money. You're wasting time, and it's just not working. <laughs> right. And talking about compliancy and my experience of stopping 82M. 
these are lifelong, correct? I mean, you cannot right. stop. So that's also another huge um, contributing factor in making a decision is that it, whether it's oral minoxidil or topical minoxidil or 82M or any of these versions, they are forever. Correct. And I, I think you make, I mean, you know, that's an extremely, extremely important point. I often get asked by patients, every single patient asks me, is this going to be forever? And then, so I tell them, I said, you know, with respect to genetic hereditary thinning, I'm not changing your genetics, right? We are only addressing the symptoms. So that's what we're trying to do. But as far as, you know, inherently, we, we, we can't change that because we can't change your parents. <laughs> exactly. Rosemary oil. This is something that I've never tried, but I hear a lot about it from my clients and obviously from social media. Yeah. What are your thoughts on rosemary oil? Because there are some trials that have shown similar efficacy compared to minoxidil. Yeah. So there is a, you know, I think it was like a 2015 uh, publication, I think, where they, uh, did a study on um, comparing efficacy of uh, daily rosemary oil application versus I think 2% minoxidil and they've shown pretty equivalent efficacy in you know hair regrowth. So there is definitely data to say that, um, that it is effective. And I've actually had a lot of patients who's actually tried it, you know, they would, but what, what I'm seeing though in real life is some patients are developing an allergic reaction to the vehicle of the mm. rosemary oil. So that is something I think, you know, to consider. So don't just buy whatever, you know, you really have to do a little bit more research. Um, whether is it significant regrowth? Um, don't really think so, in my opinion. I think, you, you know, you, I mean, if you're going to do it on your own, um, you know, it, it, it's okay, but I think you have to be a little bit careful. And, um, you know, in my, in my opinion, if you're going to seek out rosemary oil, you might as well seek somebody who truly knows what they're doing about hair growth, because there is so much more out there that's going to be so much yeah. more effective and worth your time. Yeah. Yeah. So don't just go shopping on Amazon. Yes. <laughs> Which brings me to nutraceuticals, another very popular um, self-decision-making opportunity for people to just go buy all these hair gummies and hair pills. And what are your thoughts on that? Okay. So I, I, mean, I do recommend nutraceuticals at my practice, but I am very selective as to which one I bring into my practice. It has to be nutraceuticals that has been studied well, nutraceuticals that has been proven, uh, you know, and, and I'm a dermatopathologist by training. So I know that the two nutraceuticals that I carry at my practice has been shown not just clinical improvement, but also histologically that you actually saw increased numbers of hair follicles decrease inflammation associated with, you know, the hair follicle. So I, I'm really particular because, um, you know, I'm sure you, you know this, when we talk about nutraceuticals for hair, there's a lot of other things in it. it it's mm -hmm. not just halogen. It's not just, you know, saw palmetto. There's vitamin B, right. vitamin A, vitamin K. I mean, you name it. And I'm always so worried that when, you know, patients are going to go on Amazon, just buying these, these things and still continuing, for example, their vitamin D, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if you overdose in vitamin D, there's actually some negative side effects on vitamin D because vitamin D is a, you know, it's one of the vitamins that is fat soluble. So, you, you know, you don't pee it out. Unlike there are right. other vitamins, for, right? You right. know, that, that are not fat soluble that you can get rid of, but vitamin D is not one of them. Vitamin K, vitamin A, you know, and vitamin E. So these are some, some of the examples that you really want to be careful. So I'm a little bit of a stickler. So when I talk to the patient, you know, I always make sure, you know, well, what other vitamins are you taking? Because I'm so worried that they're going to overdose on, you know, these things. So just, just check with your, you know, with your primary care doctor, you know, find somebody like Jill, you know, who's a health right. coach, very knowledgeable, right? Right. right? 
Uh, yeah, I'm also a supplement specialist, but in part of my working with my clients, I use a biochemist slash functional medicine doctor to help look at the genetics and the micronutrient status, all the test results. And then we can help direct them on supplements because you also have to look at forms. A lot of people that I yes. am helping have COMT or MTHFR or, you know, other genetics that prohibit their body from uh, synthesizing yeah. or from absorbing and utilizing nutrients that they're bringing in from these hair supplements in the wrong form. And they can do more harm than good. Yes, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next up injections. So this is also something that I tried. I tried PRP and I believe that mixed in with it was a matrix of um, maybe something from uh, the cells from the umbilical cord. Oh, mesenchymal cells. So yes, mesenchymal, yes, yep. mesenchymal cells, yes. So I did PRP twice. I did it um, three months uh, with a three month um, pause in, be in between. Oh. No, a pause in between. I, I know the protocol is three months in a row, but that's not the direction that I went. And it was very painful and very expensive. And I wasn't fully committed to it. So it didn't really work for me, but I do know people have very good success with um, injections. Tell us about your experience. So for the viewers out there, PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma therapy, right? So what, you know, so what we do is we we harvest the blood and then in the lab, we separate out the, you know, the plasma from the red blood cells. And then we further fractionate the plasma into the platelet rich portion. And then that's, that's the portion that we collect and inject back into the scalp. Now we, we already know in the literature that the, um, PRP does not work for every individual. We already know that. We don't know why PRP sometimes works for one person and not for the other. And also the fact that we also do not know why PRP could be working, for example, for one person for two, three years, and then all of a sudden just stops working. And what we think it's because the PRP is so dependent on the health status of the individual. Mm -hmm. so you have autoimmune diseases, you know, you are likely to not have those, uh, um, what we call growth factors, right? Because, because the platelets that we harvest from the individual, we take that and then we inject it into the scalp. And the idea is that these platelets stimulates and calls upon growth factors of your own. So, and then now um, in the recent, I think a couple of years, uh, maybe just like maybe just a year or a year, probably not even a year because the data came out sometime in December where they talked about um, when, when they looked at all the growth factors that the platelets that we inject into the scalp stimulated, there are actually inhibitory growth factors for, that goes against follicular growth. Mm. So, and then these growth factors at different concentrations um, so each individual has different concentrations of inhibitory as well as stimulatory growth factors. So they don't really know what to do with that data, but that's why we think certain individuals do not respond to PRP. So, and, and so I do PRP as well, you know, and, and I, 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 I do, um, you know, give my patients the opportunity if they do want to mix it with the mesenchymal stem cells. Um, but, but you know, as you know, that's not FDA approved. Uh, right. uh, you know, yeah, the the um, use of mesenchymal stem cells in hair regrowth. So I just have to make sure that your viewers know that. Um, so, you know, I just have that conversation with them and just tell the patients that because I do not know, um, you know, it, it, uh, which individuals will PRP work. Right, in. right. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the protocol, I believe, is the same once a month. Mm -hmm for three months in a row. And then there's probably maintenance um, yes. once or twice a year. Correct. And that's also forever. If you want to really stick with it. 
That also correct. Yes, I've been doing PRP for over 10 years now, and I've, I've had patients where it's still working, so I continually do it, you know. I, I try not to change it, just uh, going back to what you just yep. said earlier, that if you change one little thing, and sometimes mm -hmm. it just disturbs that balance, and here you go again, you know, you're shedding again, so. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So then what is the difference between the PRP and exosomes and stem cells okay so exosomes are, are um so so prp are you know we rely on the platelets right and then it's the platelets that then stimulates the growth factors within your system so exosomes and stem cells are derived from someone else so they're not yours they're usually derived in a tissue bank and they can be derived from the umbilical cord. They can be derived from the orange jelly. They can be so, so, so or, or the placenta. And then within the placenta, they can be derived from the cor chorionic layer, or they can also be derived from the amniotic fluid. So there's a lot of different sources. Um, exosomes are acellular. Um, so they're sort of like the juice of the stem cells. So stem cells are cells, you know, uh, um, so they're cellular, they have DNA material. Exosomes are just these little um, vesicular uh, packets that, that contains a lot of uh, what we call messenger RNA or communicatory signals that gets, in, uh, you know, integrated. Once given to you, it gets integrated into your cells and then communicates with your cells and makes these growth factors. That's what exosomes are. Now, stem cells are a little bit what they call the master regulator because they can pretty much do whatever you want it to do depending on where you, you know, um, give it. Mm -hmm. So if you inject it into the scalp and you want it to make hair follicles, then it will make you know it makes the hair follicles but but that's like um beyond or um what i call the most potent um um, uh, um stim st stimulator of hair growth yeah i remember i asked you about exosomes once and you said that the, one of the pros of it was that you use it really once a year um so there are different types within the exosome there are also di different types of it. Now, some people can get away with once a year. Some people have to do it twice a year. But again, it all depends on what's driving your hair loss. And everyone's different. And these injections could be layered onto a protocol that included a minoxidil or a finasteride or a compounded, right? These are not standalone. None of these are standalones. That's absolutely correct. It's always multi, like multi-layered. Yeah. Multi-layered. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about TED, which stands for trans epidermal. And this is what I just had with you. I did three rounds. Um, this is, I was so excited to use this when I learned about it and the availability of it in the Chicagoland area is very scarce. Um, but when I stopped using my 82M back in almost a year ago to see if I didn't have to use it anymore, and I had that terrible shed, I then had to deal with an upcoming, very exciting event in our family's life, my son's wedding, which was in June. Yeah. So in January, I started to panic thinking, oh, I've, I've got to turn this around quickly for, for this wedding. And what can I do? And it, since I only changed one thing, I thought, well, I'm going to do something that's really going to make an impact for me and just give it a shot. So I met with you and I was a good candidate for Ted. And now I'd like you to take over the mic here and tell us all about this exciting protocol. Yeah. So uh, after you know, um, as you mentioned, Ted stands for trans epidermal delivery, because TED really is just a technique where we, it, um, it's a way for us to deliver the hair growth um, factors or hair growth serum into the scalp by way of ultrasound. So, um, uh, yeah, you, you know, the, the um, technique is, uh, consists of two steps. 
the first step is where it, it, it's just a buzzing sound, right? That, that right. You know, there's a tip that we apply on the scalp. It's just a buzzing sound. And what that does, the ultrasound waves, um, it's a low frequency ultrasound. It causes these micro bubbles and the micro bubbles along with an acoustic pressure causes this, what, what, what we call cavitation. And what that does, it loosens up the um, skin cells that are packed tightly together. And when you loosen it up, then it establishes these temporary pathways or channels for the hair growth factors, which is, com which is comprised of molecular signals, known molecular signals that can stimulate follicles to grow as well as anchor the follicles on the existing follicles on the scalp. So when you do the ultrasound, you're driving all these products into the tissue and it reaches the, you know, that that portion of the follicles where it matters. Because often a lot of the topical things that we that you can do at home, um, studies have shown that you're only absorbing 5% of whatever that you're actually putting on the scalp. But in this way, you're absorbing a hundred percent because studies have shown that by way of this ultrasound technique, you're enhancing absorption by over 100% of whatever you're trying to drive in. And that's how this uh, particular technology works. Um, you know, I recommend patients to do it one, you know, one treatment every month for three months. And often you'll find that the uh, treatment for hair growth is typically done in increments of three is because it takes three months for the follicles right to go through the uh, you know growth uh, cycle and um and the particular hair growth serum as i said earlier you know is composed of these uh you know known uh, molecular signals that st stimulates hair growth but at the same time it also has components um, vitamins to enhance the luster of the uh, uh, follicles, the shine, the manageability. So you're getting a lot of the uh, other improvements. And um, they also have that particular, you know, I can't say enough good things about it because there's that particular molecule that helps anchor you know, um, your, your follicles on the scalp. So when somebody's coming in to me saying that, oh my God, my hair is shedding, or you know, I, I, I you know, I just, just don't know what to do. I often recommend this because I know that in a month or two that you should see some improvement. Um, now, I did the initial studies actually for you know this uh, particular yeah. device in. In my studies of the 50 women, not, you know, I had 96% um, success rate with regrowing these patients' hair, and over 50% of the patients, um, you know, just after two treatments, they actually saw a significant decrease in shedding, and majority of the patients uh, showed uh, increased hair growth after the third treatment. I'm, so. I'm, I wasn't in your studies, but I can attest <laughs> to all of the above. I... I was, I had the, that exact experience. One of the reasons why I chose Ted over anything else was that it's pain-free. Yeah. I have gone through the needles. It was very painful. I know that there are some doctors who use, um, and perhaps you're one of them who use a better solution on your head to numb you, but they're tiny needles. They're like insulin needles and they're, they, it can be painful. Um, so Ted was very appealing to me because of the no pain. So for those of you who can't really visualize what um, Dr. Dai is talking about, if you've ever seen those massaging guns, um, I forget the manufacturer that makes them, but it, it's kind of like that. And there's, um, and after they go through an area of your head, then there's a serum that they rub on your head and do the massaging again. So it's, it's very therapeutic and it doesn't take very long. You're very comfortable the whole time. Um, so I think it's, it's a wonderful treatment for people who are really looking to boost hair growth within one month, my hair shedding almost completely stopped and it already boosted small hairs. By the end of the third month, I was in great shape for my son's wedding. Could not tell that I had made any changes six months earlier and, you know, almost brought myself back down to square one. That's terrific. I, I mean, I'm yeah. so glad that that, yeah. that it worked for you. I mean, it, it it works for a lot of patients, but you know, I, I I do have some patients where it doesn't work. You know, but definitely the minority. Yeah, for sure. 
And I want to say, what is what is the one thing that could really help everybody, the common denominator to making sure all of these things work as good as they possibly can for you? It's lifestyle intervention, right? It's making sure you've got your diet down according to what you need for yourself, right? That's that there's no one size fits all on nutrition, making sure you're getting optimal sleep, making sure you're managing your stress, making yep. sure you're exercising, but not over exercising, right? Yes. Because <laughs> over exercising, especially during menopause is just another stressor on your body. That's right. That's right. I mean, it, it, it's really a balance. And, you know, I often have this conversation with, with my patients that, you know, you, you, it's a multimodal approach. And with that approach, it's not just medication, you know, it's not just procedural things. It's really your lifestyle, your nutrition, you know, it, 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 it's the whole package. Um, you know, I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. Dai, we're coming to an end of our wonderful conversation on hair loss to hair growth. Is there anything you would like to add before we say goodbye? If someone is out there listening to this and they're feeling really hopeless and really sad and depressed about their chronic shedding or their hair thinning, no matter what their situation is, what are some words of wisdom or advice that you could offer right now? Definitely seek out somebody who knows about hair loss seek out on, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be a, like, it doesn't have to be a hair expert, but just someone who, you know, you got to start somewhere. You can come see Jill, for example, you know, and she can help direct you. you yeah. I, so don't, I mean, you know, yes, it's very depressing, but just know that there are things that can be done. Number one, find the right person and address it. You know, don't sit there and, 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 you know, to just feel bad, just do something about it because the earlier that you intervene, the better outcome and the better success, you know, that we can achieve together. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again for all of this amazing information. I know that the listeners are out there taking away a lot of golden nuggets and it was such a pleasure to talk to you. And we'll have to bring you back on and talk about more hair loss treatments because there are other things out there as well. Yes, there are a lot of things out there. So I'm so excited. And thank you so much for having me. I mean, it's really been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Lifestyle changes can be hard and overwhelming to make. By building your support team of functional medicine doctors, therapists, and health coaches, you can reach your optimal health goals. Be sure to check out my other podcasts. Until we meet again, stay healthy.